Welcome to Lake Lawrence. My name is Barry Halverson. I'll be narrating this uh, video of the history of Lake Lawrence. This is an overview of the Lake Lawrence area, showing all the key locations that will be discussed throughout this video. talk about the history of Lake Lawrence, you have to go back to when the lake was formed. Lake Lawrence was formed several thousand years ago as the Vashon Glacier retreated from the Puget Sound region north into Canada. In doing so, it left behind a huge boulder approximately 100 yards west of the intersection of Lindsay Road and 153rd Avenue near the fire station. The boulder is approximately 15 foot tall. The boulder is known as a glacial erratic, defined as a piece of rock that differs from the size and type of rock native to the area in which it rests. I'll show you a couple slides that talk about that glacial period that are specifically oriented toward the South Puget Sound area and this area all the way to Tonino. This is a depiction of the Puget Lobe which reached its extent in the vicinity of present-day Tanino and was approximately 200 meters or 660 feet deep in the Tanino area. It comes from the Vashon glaciation, a local term for most, the more recent period of very cold climate in which during its peak, glaciers covered the entire Salish Sea, as well as present-day Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia, and other surrounding areas in the western part of present-day Washington. This occurred during a cold period around the world known as the last glacial period. The Vashon glaciation is an extension of the Fraser glaciation in which the Cordilleran ice sheet advanced south of the present day Canada United States border into the Puget Sound region. This southern part of the Cordilleran ice sheet is called the Puget lobe. In 1873, this 330 acre lake in South Eastern Thurston County was surveyed by DSB Henry. Henry reported that there were between 25 and 30 settlers in the township surrounding the lake, and that some of the settlers had resided upon the property for 15 to 20 years. The lake is divided into two distinct basins. The larger east basin, which you're looking at now, is 277 acres in size, with the west basin being 53 acres. The surveyors began the, at the west end corner near the shore. It took them three days to accomplish their task. The head man in the field party wrote, a beautiful sheet of water surrounded by cedar, fir, alder, and vine maple. Jim Candle, an early resident, gave the lake its first name, Candle Lake. At the time, the area was surrounded by wildlife. The survey team said deer, grouse, and mink were bountiful. Within the lake were many suckers and rainbow trout. Prior to 1951, the lake had perch, bass, catfish, suckers, and crappie. In 1951, the lake was rehabilitated and filled with trout only. The catfish, suckers, and crappie survived and continued to grow in the lake, but other species were added to include channel catfish, brown bullheads, which are native, bluegill, largemouth, and smallmouth bass. Many years ago, the lake gained renown as being one of the best fishing lakes this side of the mountains. Today, people still reach limits with trout and bass, but the waters are not filled like they once were. In 1884, there was a bustling sawmill uh, in this area. Another mill was operating by the early 1890. They were fairly small operations according to today's standards, employing about five men apiece. Today, there are remaining slabs from the mill's activities in the waters of the lake. The labs originated from the mill's activities. The slabs consisted of sawed logs that were trimmed with bark intact. They were dumped with the sawdust into the lake and most were 16 feet long. This activity in large part contributed to the heavy mucky sediment currently found in the lake. Horse and oxen often pulled the logs to the mill. This is a small community park on uh, what is known as the northwest end of the west basin of the lake, which is approximately 54 acres in size. And this end of the lake 
used to house a sawmill. This is a very shallow area, no more than two or three feet deep. Some of the wildlife we have down here. Drive carefully. We don't want you to hurt them, and we certainly don't want them to hurt you. As we just saw the deer on the road, uh, this area is home to deer, elk, coyote, possum, raccoon, rabbit, beaver, otter, muskrat, nutria. You name it, we about have it out here. Uh, got eagles, a lot of them. Uh, in the early spring, we've seen as many as uh, 20 eagles in the air over the lake at one time. We have osprey, Canadian geese year-round. We've got resident geese here. A variety of ducks and a lot of cormorants in the winter months. In approximately 1888, Sam or Jim Lawrence, uh, the documents identify the first name differently depending on what document you look at, bought the Candle property. The lake's name was changed then to Lake Lawrence. In the lifetime of Lee and Dallas Edwards, early settlers on the lake, many changes have taken place on the lake and the surrounding area. Lake Lawrence West housing development was nearly all trees. That's the area you're looking at now. So, the, so was the land of Scenic Shores development. This land was originally owned by the McKenna Lumber Company. Later it was sold to George DeWitt. George DeWitt's daughter, Leona, sold the area to Dallas Edwards, Lee Edwards, Mike Edwards, Larry Shorno, and Bob Landon, and they developed it into scenic shores. Lee and Ruby Edwards developed the Lake Lawrence West area, and Wild Air, another housing development, was owned and developed by Bill Goodwin and his family. The Lake Lawrence properties comprise about 301 properties belonging to the Lake Lawrence Community Club HOA. The Scenic Shores property, where we're coming up on now, is comprised of about 210 parcels in their HOA. Each one of the HOAs, except Lisa Lane, has their own community park and boat launch area and swim area. In between Scenic Shores and Wild Air HOAs is private parcels, mostly timbered along the shoreline. This is the Wild Air Community Park and the Wild Air Association comprise of about 59 properties. Lake Lawrence Road. This is the ditch that was dug in uh, 1907 from the Deschutes River uh, near Cougar Mountain Camp into the south end of Lake Lawrence, which is over in that direction. This is where the ditch continues, which added sediment to the lake for over 20 years. There's a lot of shallow littoral area here in a wetland area from where you can see the start of the vegetation all the way to the tree line. So this is the dam view from Pleasant Beach Drive. There is no stream or above ground water source to feed Lake Lawrence. The lake has numerous springs that feed the lake from the bottom. This is the old dam or weir site in the West Basin. You can see it still exists today. In 1908, the Olympia Light and Power Company, later bought out by Puget Power, needed more energy. They dammed up the south end of the lake off Pleasant Beach Drive and placed a gate where the lake enters the creek to the Deschutes River. This used to be a ravine that flowed all the way down to the Deschutes River. They dammed it up by building this road, Pleasant Beach Road, across here and putting this, uh, this dam with this gates at the bottom. There were three gates, one on each side, one in the front, 
You can see them if you look very closely. And they had a wheel at the top of this 20-foot tower that they would turn, and it would open these gates and allow the water to flow out to the Deschutes River. When it was closed, the diversion dam would raise the lake level by about 18 feet at various times. In the fall, when the water would get low in the river, they would open the gate so the waters of Lake Lawrence would su could supplement the power plant in Tumwater. The power supplied all of the Olympia area. This procedure was used until 1928 when the power plant in Tumwater was abandoned. This is a photograph of the Lake Lawrence Resort sometime between 1908 and 1928 when the water level was raised by the diversion of the Deschutes River into Lake Lawrence. You can see that the water level comes up within 200 feet of the resort lodge and the two-story Edwards family home. This shows a view of the Lake Lawrence Resort on opening day of fishing season in 1940 from up near the back of the pavilion. This is a close-up view of that uh, same date and time in 1940. This is a view of the Lake Lawrence Resort area. You can see where Lindsay Road is up there at the top. This was an aerial photograph taken in 1945. And I tried to estimate where the water line was, where it would come up to if the lake was filled 18 foot above its present depth. This is an aerial view off Google Maps of the Lake Lawrence Community Club Resort area as it is today. To facilitate the dam and the rise in water level, Frank and Jenny Edwards' two-story house that now sits adjacent to the Lake Lawrence Lodge, as you can see up here in the video, had to be removed from down by the lake up to the hill by three teams of horses. The resort got its start here on the hill. While the lake was still high, the little general store was in the end building next to the house, now over a century old. Once called the Edwards Pavilion, the Lake Lawrence Lodge was erected in 1923 by Mr. Armstrong Louis and Albert Reichel and headed by J.P. Martin, who was a local bridge builder. The dimensions of the all-first structure is approximately 120 feet by 140 feet. All logs were felled from off the lake property itself. They were hand-peeled and hewn, and the steel rods were hand-tooled. The fireplace that we'll see in a minute when we go inside was erected by Frank Noreen from Deschutes Falls. It took about one year to complete this building, and this became the extension of the Edwards Resort, a fishing and recreational getaway here on Lake Lawrence. In 1973, the over 50-year-old resort closed and the camping area came to an end. The resort property is now enjoyed by many private property owners. That cafe, building, swimming area, and Edwards Pavilion became part of the Lake Lawrence Community Club which still maintains these facilities for the benefit of their members. The lodge is also available to the community at large for all types of events to include weddings, anniversaries, birthdays, family reunions, and any other event. Although much remains the same, a few necessary improvements have been made since the first dance in the 1920s. This historically unique building holds many weddings and special occasions every weekend of the year. Music and laughter have penetrated these walls for decades. The floors have endured many nights of dancing feet and wonderful memories that still linger as tears and joy continue to flow thanks to the many volunteers of the Lake Lawrence Community Club. This is a photograph taken sometime in the mid-1920s uh, at one of the dances at the Edwards Pavilion. This is a picture of the inside of the Edwards Pavilion in the 1950s. Now we'll show you what it looks like inside today. Inside the uh, Edwards Pavilion, once it was completed, uh, everybody, they would have dances every Saturday night starting in May and ending in October. Many popular bands from around the area played here. People came from Tacoma and Seattle in their Model T Fords and earlier in their horse and buggies. Jenny and Dallas Edwards would go to downtown Tacoma in their Model 1924 Model T Ford and advertise the dances at places like Taylor's, Mecca Restaurant, Tambles Tamales, Bimbo's, and Hunt and Moffat. Their advertising brought in huge 
crowds of 1,200 people for the first dance, which left standing room only. People had to take their turns on the dance floor as well as in the chairs. The next dance turned out 800, and after that, a regular crowd of 250 to 350 came. Couples paid $1.10 each for the dance and 50 cents for supper, which was served at midnight. Children were welcome at these affairs. A room about 20 foot by 20 feet was provided with small wooden cribs in two rows stacked three high in this area that I'm showing you right now, off to the side right here. Each crib had a safety latch on the outside so their babies didn't fall out and was lined with a cotton mattress. Mothers checked their babies regularly during the evening. Dinner was prepared and served by Jenny, a small crew of five women, and Shirley Edwards, her daughter, who helped at a young age. The boys, Ozzy, Dallas, and Lee, worked to sell pop, candy, gum, and cigarettes, as well as man the coat check stand. Supplies for the confectionery came from the co-op grain store located in the corner of 4th and Main, which Frank managed. For a charge of 10 cents, each coat was folded and stuffed into a cubbyhole and brass tag given to each person with a number corresponding to the number on the cubbyhole. The earliest restrooms were outside, just a short walk from the lodge. Later, around 1950, when Lee and Ruby Edwards were running the dances, they put in the present restrooms, which I'm showing you a picture of now, over here in this corner. This is the old fireplace that kept the place warm. That was the only heat in the place, except for those that were in here dancing. We get 350 people in here, it warmed up pretty quick. Around the late 1960s and early 1970s, Lee Edwards dug the canal around a five acre plus plot of land, forming the island on the northwest end of the lake, commonly referred to as Goat Island. This is a photograph of Goat Island, right after the canal was dug and the bridges were installed. You can see the walking bridge in the lower left and the car bridge in the right side. You can see Lake Point Drive in the background. No house is built there yet. You can see the sheds for the goats in the center of the picture. Around the same time, the two bridges, one a footbridge and the other a car bridge, were then constructed to make the island accessible. One was located about 100 yards from where I'm at right now, where those two big trees are on the sides of the canal. And the other was located about 100 yards toward the front of the canal. It was a personnel bridge, a walking bridge. Goats were purchased and placed on the island and cared for by local residents who also built a shed for winter protection. These community volunteers also provided feed and the services of a veterinarian. The goats kept the island trimmed of vegetation and the bridges made it possible to walk about and enjoy the island. Unfortunately, after several years, a large pack of dogs attacked and killed the goats. A few years before that, the bridges were taken down due to safety concerns. The Lake Lawrence Community Club, who owned the island property, also still own access points to the island where the previous bridges were. The club has been working for the past 15 years to rehabilitate the island and has long-range plans to reconstruct at least one of the bridges on the canal. That is Bureau of Land Management Island, or BLM Island as we call it here at Lake Lawrence. And I'm going to scan the shoreline of the Thurston County Undeveloped Park which was donated to the county in 1988 and remains a wonderful fishing area for the public. There's a trail all the way along that shoreline and a lot of people use it. This is the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, a boat launch and is adjacent to the undeveloped land acquired by Thurston County in 1988. In September 2019, the public boat launch was renovated with improved facilities, parking, boat dock, and ramp. This is the channel between the East Basin and the West Basin. Maximum depth right in the center is about eight feet. We hope you enjoyed this video and we look forward to bringing you many more.